that Michael said that to me is really important, I think, for everyone in this room, uh, because we are all connected, is the alignment between industry, academic, and government. And all of us play a role in that in some way, shape, or form. Um, and that's part of the power of a summit such as this, is to get the awareness of how we need to work together and collaborate. Um, the reason why we put this panel together is to get a perspective on workforce training and development and how that interacts in our own region. And um, I'm very pleased to have um, three local companies, um, Ben Despain from Owens Corning Gresham Phone Plant, um, Dustin Schaub from Toyo Tonso, and Roger Budge from On Semiconductor. And I'm not going to go into uh, a lengthy description of their companies because um, Andrew McGough, who is our moderator today um, with Work System Inc. is going to um, facilitate the conversation so we learn a little bit about all their companies. So with that, I'm just going to introduce um, Andrew and we're going to go from there. Um, Andrew is the Executive Director of Work Systems Inc., um, which is a not-for-profit not workforce intermediary serving the greater Portland, Oregon, and metropolitan area. And in his capacity, he oversees an annual workforce investment of approximately $20 million and a staff of 25 through multiple local, state, and federal grants and contracts and see, uh, fees for service activities. And so he is very, very involved in the whole workforce development and training um, projects around the state. And I, I'm so, I had a great conversation as we were planning um, the summit, and we talked a lot about the importance of education um, at all levels and how that aligns with our workforce readiness. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Andrew. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thanks, Allison. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am Andrew McGough, as Allison mentioned, and thank you so much for coming. And I got a very easy job today. I just have to read. But the problem was I wrote a bunch of stuff all over the things I was supposed to read, and then I didn't bring my glasses, so I am sort of uh, won't be reading from the script. But I'll do the best I can to make this interesting and move stuff along. We're really fortunate to be joined by uh, three business people today. Um, representing some really, oh, why, th why thank you. I don't, I don't even know if I need these, so, um, but I appreciate the offer. Um, but three really great uh, business people that are uh, representative of a, a, a pretty good cross-section of uh, manufacturers uh, in the area, in East County, and uh, also with some pretty interesting approaches to and challenges to skilling up their workforce. So I think Allison's idea today was, you know, you go from Boeing and uh, Adventist and big uh, systems and big organizations d down, and this will sort of bring us down to the ground to what some local folks are doing to try and address some of the challenges that they're seeing and how they're being creative to solve some workforce problems. So I'm going to start today, and uh, I'm going to let folks introduce themselves, but I'll start down the list. And uh, on the end there, we have uh, Dustin Shop, and Dustin is with uh, Toyo Tanso. Uh, next to Dustin, we have uh, Ben Despain from Owens Corning, Gresham's Foam Plant. And finally, Roger Budge from On Semiconductor. So thanks for joining us, you guys. And maybe we'll start with you, Ben, and you can just explain your uh, company, what your position is there, and maybe just give us some background and insight into some of the workforce issues and some of the things that are going on in uh, Tonso. Okay. Um, my name is Dustin Schaub. Um, I'm the JSOX coordinator for Toyo Tonso. Um, JSOX is the Japanese version of Sarbanes-Oxley, so I do quite a bit of internal auditing uh, for our company. Oops. Hey, there we go. <laughs> There, does that help? <laughs> um, we're, we're, our U.S. headquarters is in Troutdale. Um, we, about two years ago, opened a small manufacturing facility also in Connecticut. Um, between the two, we employ about 200 people with uh, about 185 being in Troutdale. Um, we've been in Troutdale for 21 years and in uh, East County for 25 years total. Uh, our product is uh, isomolded graphite, um, basically some of the properties of it. Uh, it's an excellent conductor of heat and electricity, as well as being corro uh, corrosion resistant to uh, heat and chemicals. And because of these properties, um, the industries that use this are solar, semiconductor, LED, and EDM. Um, 
uh, basically our, our business model involves importing raw material from Japan, from our parent company, um, and machining it to customer specifications here in Troutdale and if, uh, excuse me, in Connecticut. Um, in addition to the machining process, we also have a purification process in which we essentially cook out impurities from the graphite, as well as an SIC coating process, SIC is silicon carbide. Um, it essentially puts a candy coated shell on the graphite and uh, allows it, the, uh, it does not wear as, as easily. Um, some of our competitive advantages include uh, the consistently high quality graphite that we do offer and basically that allows our customers to remove uh, one variable from their process. Um, then we also have R&D design engineers on staff uh, that are experts in our field and understand graphite really well and can help our customers um, design new graphite parts for their ma manufacturing process. And then of course our, machine, our precision machining capabilities. So that's, that's a little bit about Tonzo. Yeah, let, let me just uh, point out, Dustin is the young guy that Graham <laughs> pointed out that uh, was the finance major and decided to go into manufacturing. Uh, so I, I think that that is a good story, uh, an interesting story. Uh, can you tell, how many, how many employees do you have locally in? Do you know approximately how many live in East County? Uh, I'm not sure on how many live in East County. Um, I would say a majority of them, though, if I had to guess. Um, but yeah, 185 about it at our facility. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, let's let's jump to uh, Owens Corning and uh, uh, Ben. Can you tell us a little bit about your operations here? Sure. Well, our Owens Corning foam plant uh, produces basically extrudes foam insulation boards. Uh, a couple months ago, we did host an open house uh, for the chamber. Was there anyone here that was able to come visit our tour and to our facility? Oh, oh just, a, just a few. Um, our process is, is pretty interesting. And when you think about it, you know, Owens Corning, you know, insulation, you know, pretty simple product. It's a pretty simple process. Uh, but, you know, as we talk about the, the, how manufacturing has changed, uh, it's incredibly technical. Uh, we talk about the chemical engineering that goes into it, the mechanical engineering that goes into our, our process and our, and our line, and it's a, in theory, if everything's running right, it should be not touched by human hands at all. From the fact that, you know, we're extruding it, we have a fully continuous automated line, um, goes through all the, the machines to cut it, to size it, to package it, and then the forklift driver goes and puts it on the, on the, uh, on the truck. Um, so if everything runs well, it's not being touched at all until it's at the job site and they're starting to put that foam um, in the, into the construction site. Uh, we make foam board that primarily goes into construction um, of new buildings. Uh, a lot of it's commercial, but we also make some very, very dense stuff. It's almost like wood, um, very thick that goes underneath um, airport runways underneath uh, freeways, you know, to keep that insulation there so you don't have the, the, the fluctuations in temperature that that really can damage uh, those things there. Uh, our facility here in Gresham started up in 2009, um, so it's, it's a new facility, um, and we, right now we are employing about 45 employees with about a quarter of that here in the East Metro area. And I, myself, am one of those. Uh, I joined Owens Corning about six months ago and made the move up here from Phoenix about three months ago and actually live here in Gresham. So I'm, I'm happy to be part of, of this area. Um, Owens Corning does have a number of other facilities in the area uh, that I also uh, provide support to, but our Gresham facility is very unique in the fact that we run what we call a high performance organization where we do not have supervisors. We, it's very team-based, very engagement-driven, very empowerment-driven, um, employee-involved. Uh, you know, each employee has responsibility. Um, and in Owens Corning as a corporation, we're based in to Toledo, Ohio. We've come out and said, we will not have any accidents. Uh, we're a manufacturing facility. We think every accident is preventable. And that's come out, so that's, our, that's one of our, our key things, like no accidents. People should leave work the same way they came. Um, there's no, nothing that, that cannot be prevented from accident perspective. And that, that's a very different perspective than some of the other manufacturing places I've been. Even though they've had fantastic safety records, um, 
that line in the sand of zero accidents really drives a lot of what we do. And each of our employees own different safety programs and are responsible for driving that and really owning that as part of their responsibilities. Um, another thing that we have to do as part of that to really help um, grow them is each employee has an individual growth and development plan that's separate from their performance appraisal that they own and they have to put together and they're responsible for identifying the things that they want to be uh, trained in and developed in and working through identifying for themselves what are things that they need. So we work a very involved um, culture and, and environment and have to do that, I think, in order to be successful at what we do. Because it is a small facility, we can't have the, a lot of the infrastructure that, that's needed. So, so we get around that by making people more involved in driving decisions, because when you have decisions being made at the point where they're being ex executed, you're going to have better execution, you're going to have better decisions. And so that's really what, what we try to do. And, and our facility has been identified by our corporation as a model for that. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to, to gain some of those things and say, well, how do we roll this out across the entire enterprise? Um, so so the, the group that we have here uh, is, is a great group and a great team, and we've had to work very hard to get that way. Well, thanks, Ben. Um, I, I suspect we're going to hear more about high performance and lean stuff as we go through this. But let's hear from Roger Budge, who's with uh, On Semiconductor. A more well-known East County employer, I might say. I didn't know we did foam, and I didn't know we did graphite, but um, it's nice to know that now. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we've had the privilege of being mentioned a few times during the meeting today, uh, most notably because we are the former LSI Logic facility in Gresham, and we were thankfully bought by On Semiconductor in 2006. I think I speak for all of our employees that that was one of the best things that ever happened to our site. It's a great company to work for. On Semiconductor is one of the global leader in semiconductor manufacturing. We have 19,000 employees worldwide. Uh, the exciting part for all of us in this room is that 550 or so uh, are here in Gresham at the Gresham facility. And out of that percentage, we were able to put that together. About 42% we came up with yesterday live here in the East Metro area. So pretty substantial part of the workforce. And if you expand it out to include more Portland, you can get that number up to about 60%. But being an East County native, I kind of drew the line a little short. So uh, about 40% of the workforce comes right here from East County. Uh, what we do at the facility here in Gresham is we are one of the flag we are the flagship manufacturing facility for the company. And what that means to us is we get a lot of opportunities to take new products and develop them in our site. And we take raw silicon wafers and we manufacture them into parts that go into a wide variety of electronic devices. So with I think I can wager that of all the phones and cameras and monitors and TVs in here, I can guarantee you that there's an on semiconductor chip somewhere in this room. I would think I would win that wager if I bet on that. So we make a lot of parts for a lot of different applications, you know, computers, TVs, cars, uh, aerospace, all those types of things. We have a part in it. So we have a very diversified portfolio as a company, and Gresham, we're very fortunate to be able to contribute to that portfolio in a lot of different ways. Uh, the facility, I don't know if I mentioned, it, was built in 1997, uh, opened up in 2006, or was bought by On Semi in 2006. So we've had a, a good run here with On Semiconductor, and we're very excited about the future. Well, thank you, Roger. Um, let's get into that question about training and what you guys do uh, to improve the quality of your workforce and ensure that they have the skills that they need to, you know, uh, compete in the market and meet your company goals. Why don't we go back to you, Ben, since you sort of mentioned the high performance. I know that for many years we did a lot of work with uh, current workers and current worker training, incumbent workers, and by, by and far on the manufacturing side, it was all about high performance, it was all about lean and looking for ways to improve process in order to reduce costs and ultimately uh, be more competitive. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, you know, when we look at our high-performance organization, you know, I like to boil it down to there are basically two different skill sets that you need. Um, you know, one's the technical skills, uh, you, know, the, you know, how to run the, the equipment, how to, to do other things. But I like also to, to drill down a little bit more. And I think the problem-solving skills are, are strong 
pieces of that that you need. You need um, people that can really solve problems and know how to go through and look at it analytically and, and run the, the analysis to, to, to get to it and to solve the problem instead of just masking it and fixing it you know, so we can run, so, so really getting at it. And then on the other piece, in order for it to really work, is you have to have strong, what we call teaming skills. Um, those social skills, interpersonal skills. If you have a team that can collaborate, can, can communicate, can give each other feedback, solve conflict amongst themselves, um, then you're going to have a very a much more effective team. And when you give them the problem solving skills and those technical skills, then that's when you get that, that high performance. So most of our training is focused on, on one of those two buckets. Um, the technical skills, you know, there's lots of things going on. You know, we've got maintenance uh, individuals, you know, LME requirements. So, you know, there's a lot of resources out there. We utilize some of the, the external um, partners for it. We have a couple people in the apprentice program with the Portland Community College for LMEs. Uh, we did the PGA, um, uh, just have a guy get his PJ license, um, other things like that. And then a lot of the internal uh, stuff we handle a lot on our own, the, the teaming, you know, really getting them together. It's like how do you make decisions as a team? How do you solve conflict as a team? How do you work things out as a team? Because you have to be able to do that in order to not have supervisors. Um, so, so we identify that, you know, it's more of a, a full employee development instead of just the technical skills and, you know, looking at it as a whole, how can we work through that? And that individual growth and development plan that I talked about is a big piece of that. That's more employee driven, say, here's the things I want to, to learn and I want to grow. And they say, okay, that's great. How are you gonna do that? And then we work with them to identify some of those, those sources and avenues. But when it's more driven by them, you know, it's, it's more, uh, they have more passion with it. How about you, Dustin? What, what, what goes on at Toyo Tanso related to training? Yeah, we do um, something similar to what Ben's talking about as far as um, it's continuing education essentially at our facility, um, which, which, in, Jesus, things are going to fall over. There, does that work? There we go. Yeah. Um, continuing education, which um, includes not only um, identifying maybe where an employee is um, not as strong in a certain area through um, uh, reviews with their managers, but also, as Ben kind of mentioned, um, what do you want to do? What what are things that interest you? Um, so we kind of we do we try to aim to have each employee go through a seminar or a training or a class each year. I'm sorry, every six months, <laughs> each review cycle, um, and target an area that they would like to improve in. So are those delivered on site, or do you sign um, them up? Yeah, usually we'd, we'd contact an outside vendor. You'd go to a, a class, or like New Horizons is one that we deal with quite often with uh, computers and things, so for computer classes and training. And the company reimburses the cost? Yeah, the that? company just pays for okay. it up front. And is that the same with you guys, Ben, or do you deliver it in-house? or? No, it's, it's a big variety of, of ways, depending on what is needed. You know, we go source it, uh, you know, external or internal. Um, and yeah, we and we cover that. You know, we make sure that you know if it's related to the job or part of their plan that we're going to to do what we need to do to help them get that training. How about you, Roger? I I know you're the director of training and development is is my guess, and you're actually slightly larger than these guys. So, is it the same for you guys, or how do you how do you go about developing your workforce? We have a, a lot of uh, systems in place. We're very fortunate that we're able to have an in-house manufacturing training program. Uh, that I'm the supervisor of that department. Uh, we have some former manufacturing specialists that are in charge of training all the new hires when they come on board. We take brand new people and we take them for a week before they even hit the factory floor. And we train them on a lot of our systems and computer software and just our policy, our culture, those types of things before we even let them in the factory. So that's a big key to our success in bringing on new people and teaching them and getting them up to speed. Also, as far as developing our workforce, it's something that's very important to us. On Semiconductor is very generous and has an employee assistance, edu education assistance program where we actually encourage our employees to go out and pursue degrees, either associate's degrees or bachelor's degrees. Now, we, you know, obviously we steer them into areas that are gonna benefit us as a company, such as engineering, you know, electrical engineering, chemical engineering, management, those types of programs. But it's a very popular program as it provides tuition reimbursement for the employees. 
Also, we will occasionally be able to modify their shift to allow them to attend classes. So that's something that's been very beneficial to us. We've got a lot of people take advantage of it. And what that allows us to do is take people within our organization and develop them in-house to fulfill some of the roles that otherwise might be more difficult to fill, such as an engineering position or a technician position. So instead of having to rely on outside sources for that, we're able to develop it in-house. And that's something that's been very beneficial for On Semiconductor and for our Gresham campus in particular. Thanks. Um, so we heard some talk about skill shortages today, difficulty finding qualified workers. Could we hear from each of you guys, is that, is that a challenge for you? Is it not? You know, as Graham mentioned, we have large pools of people who are unemployed, actually pretty highly skilled people who are unemployed. Is it difficult to find workers? How about you, Roger? Um, at times, it has been a little bit of an issue. Um, it was something that Ben was just talking about is you know, one of the unique challenges in our manufacturing environment as well is that we expect people to have the skills in math, engineering, science, those types of skills. But in order to be successful on a team, and we work in a very team environment also, you have to have the soft skills. And I think sometimes that's what the real challenge is, is finding people with both of those skill sets combined to be able to contribute in our team type environment. Uh, some of the things that we've done to help develop that workforce and to fill those roles, uh, we participate in the MECOP program, which Boeing was just talking about with you know, local universities. Uh, we've also you know, brought in uh, high school students for tours. Uh, I know the Center for Advanced Learning, Cal, they've come on site several times and had tours on the site. And we try and stimulate an interest in coming to work at our facility or just you know, to pursue a science and engineering route as well. Um, those have all been successful. You know, and trying to get people to see that that is a career option and to bring those people into work for us. So that's something that we've tried to do. Yeah, that's great. How about you, Ben? Have you seen any uh, challenges finding qualified workers? Yeah, from the technical side, um, the, the challenge comes for us, you know, as I mentioned, that we are a, f a fully automated line. Um, even though if someone's got manufacturing experience, you know, sometimes it's not necessarily in a fully automated um, environment and and so the level of uh, technical skills that we need are, are a little higher than, than um, some of the you know other manufacturing that some of the people have coming from even though like I said every piece of, of manufacturing is, is getting much more technical um, but sometimes I you know when things are going right as I mentioned they're not even supposed to be touching the product um, so so getting through that and helping them understand that, you know, that there's, there's a lot more of the, the computer work, you know, running the automated uh, equipment um, piece, you know, finding that someone with that background uh, is a little bit of a struggle, along with the maintenance, um, finding uh, qualified maintenance individuals, because that definitely is a, a key um, component of, of, our, of our success. And um, that's why we've got a couple people in the, the maintenance apprentice program right now, you know, so we're, we're building them. Um, you know, getting ready for, for uh, one we need because it's, you know, two years at least before someone can get that uh, license and, and be able to have their LME. I mean, we've been able to pull people. We've got employees that come up from Albany, from Scapoose, from, um, you know, Battleground, you know, so we're pulling people from, from quite a ways away. And, uh, you know, we started up in 09, and, and so from Graham's slide, you know, you can see that where we were at, uh, we, we had an opportunity to, to really uh, look at some, some good qualified folk, but as we continue to go forward, um, those have been a couple of the, the, the areas that we've had struggle finding from the technical side, but then from the, um, the interpersonal side, you know, that teaming piece, that's, that's also been a struggle, finding the right cultural fit. Um, so generally, a lot of times we look, if they got the cultural fit, you know, we can, you know, train them on the technical side. Um, but finding both definitely is, is a challenge and something we're always looking at whenever we bring people on. Right. Dustin, anything to add? Yeah, what? and talking with our uh, managers at work, one of the um, areas that we've had a difficulty finding people is highly qualified CNC machinists. Um, talking with our machine shop manager about what we do uh, to combat that issue, um, we have begun to really promote from within. Um, we do have a tuition reimbursement program also, so uh, we'll take our and encourage our uh, highest qualified uh, manual machinists to go to school, get a two-year degree in CNC machining, have the company pay for it, and uh, that's kind of how we've been, been dealing with that shortfall. 
You know, it's kind of funny because uh, we did some work with the Technology Association of Oregon, and they they mentioned the same sort of challenges. And it's you know, it's not rocket science. You kind of hear the same stuff over and over again. Soft skills are so essential to the way uh, business models have evolved over time. I mean, I think you just have to have those team uh, building, those uh, communication skills, those foundational skills. And frankly, what we hear from employers is on the occupational side, we don't have a problem uh, investing in those technical skills or investing in those occupational skills. It's those other places where we find ourselves to be most challenged. Um, so is all of that training done internally, or do you seek any external vendors to do that? And if you do, who are they? Do you partner with community colleges or other local vendors? Uh, yeah, Roger? Start? Yeah, uh, one of the reasons that I think I'm here, actually, is that we've done a lot of partnering with Mount Hood Community College. And uh, one of the things that we find very advantageous from that is particularly when you're dealing with some of these soft skill type classes, maybe you only want to you want to bring on a trainer from an external training company, but to fly them out here to give a class to say eight people at On Semiconductor might not be economically feasible. But if we coordinate through uh, Mount Hood, we're able to set us something up where we work with Boeing, Microchip, other employers in the area. And now instead of having them come out and us footing the whole bill, we can you know get a third of the bill and get a lot more bang for our buck that way. Um, I've been per personally, I've been involved in training classes where we've had people from all the companies out here that we've talked about today, and it's been very productive for us. So that's one strategy that we've used, partnering with our local companies in the area and with the local college, and works out very well. In addition to that, one thing that's been very successful for us with Mount Hood and also with WSI is on occasion being able to find state and federal training grants, which also helps uh, you know, ease the burden of the cost as well. So those have all been strategies that we've pursued to get that training. Great. How about you, Dustin? Do you use any exterior, external vendors? or? Yeah, just in the last couple of years, I would say we've really opened our eyes and began to look around at, at what's available to us as a, as a business in the area. Um, we've utilized the WorkSource Oregon's uh, on-the-job training program, which has allowed us to uh, hire a worker, and during their training period, uh, WorkSource actually pays for a portion of their wages. Uh, that's been a big help to us. Um, we've partnered with uh, Mount Hood Community College. They have a vocational English as a second language program, um, which essentially is a, a crash course in specific in industry-specific classes. Um, and for people who English is not their first language, um, we've hired a gentleman out of that program. Uh, we have a few people in the electrician apprenticeship programs, um, like, like Ben was talking about. And um, our machine shop manager is currently sitting on the uh, Mount Hood Community College's Career and Technical Advisory Committee. So he's able to give them feedback as far as what the industry is looking for in, in newly hired employees. And then we do hold tours for schools like Cal and uh, Mount Hood Community College. So, God, You guys are busy. How about you, Ben? You uh, ditto. <laughs> <laughs> All yeah, of the above. I like that. Well, let's do this. I'm going to wind down with one more formal question, and then we'll open it up to the audience, and then we'll turn it back over to Allison, who can get us out of here today. So if you were promoting East Metro to a visiting company, say, say some big organization want to locate here, what would you tell them about East Metro, about the workforce, about the environment, what would you do to help land the deal for this new company? Roger? Well, in the interest of full disclosure, I grew up here, so I'm very biased. I went to Trout Well, you should be the first to talk to Trout Elementary that. School and Columbia <laughs> High School, so I'm very biased, and so I want people to come to East Metro. I um, always had a chip on my shoulder about the west side, so <laughs> not that we're in direct competition with them or not. but. Um, I think the biggest thing to tout, you know, we just had the presentation from Adventist Health and from Boeing. Where they talked a lot about the culture of their companies and about, I think that we can sell the culture of the area, that we work very well with that type of environment. You know, the, if you have happy employees, you're going to have a happier organization and a more successful organization. So the, promoting this as a great place to live, I think, is something that we can do. I mean, obviously, we've got the gorge, Mount Hood, the ocean, a lot of things to sell about this area. 
you know, and then the Port of Portland presented this morning and talked about the logistical advantages. We've got an you know, international airport just down the road. We've got FedEx, so all the transportation needs you'd ever want are here. Mm -hmm. So we have logistical advantages there. We talked about the property next to On Semiconductor, you know, being tier one ready. Well, we've got a great spot for you as well. So I think those are all things that we can sell. As far as the workforce, I think one of the things that we could really push is you know, we have a lot of this collaboration already going on with the local college, you know, with the, the local employers, that there's a spirit of cooperation here and we can work together and you can get a lot more, you know, I've, I used the term once already, but you can get a lot more bang for your buck if you locate here and partner up with some of the other people already in the area. I mean, we'd love to share training with somebody next door, hint, hint. So. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, sign him up, huh? Uh, all right, Ben, your shot. Well, from a lifelong resident to a three-month resident of the area. By the way, the weather's like this all the time. <laughs> that, that's what they told me when they recruited me. So, uh, um, you know, and I've lived a number of places in, in the U.S. And, and, and so, you know, I look at here, and one, you know, as Roger mentioned, the livability of this area is a big pull. And, um, you know, not just, you know, when you come in, you bring a, a organization, you know, you're probably going to have to bring some, some leadership uh, talent from, from within the company elsewhere. And, and it's a really nice place to live and, and to raise a family um, and, you know, a great culture. Uh, but one thing, you know, in my short amount of time, and it's evidenced by, I think, this summit, is I've been very impressed by how involved the chamber is and, and the collaboration that's going on between the different companies and things like that. So, you know, you come here as a company, you're not alone. Um, you know, you've got friends, you've got people that can work with you and, and can help you and you can collaborate and, and work together. And in other places I've lived, you know, we haven't had that. Um, so I think that is, is a great uh, benefit to have and, and to, to tout and along with the other things, you know, the, the, the great culture in the area, the, the livability. Um, um, just make sure you take pictures of it, like right now, and yeah. and, and use this as as, as your thing. And um, but yeah, it's, it's it's a great place to live. And, and and I think, as Roger mentioned, that when people enjoy where they live, they're going to be happier at work and more productive. And when you got good resources available to you, that can really help you um, in navigating some of the. Uh, different um, business re regulations that, that we have here than elsewhere. Well, it's nice to hear from a new resident, isn't it? It's really great. Um, Dustin? Well, I, like Roger, have been in the area um, all my life, and I think these guys have pretty much hit it right on the head. Um, one of the things that continually keeps me here is the recreational opportunities and just the livability of, of, of being on, uh, in Oregon. Well, that's great. Terrific. I, I, I want to thank our panel. Uh, I thought uh, they brought a lot of really great insight, and thanks for taking the time today and uh, putting the thought into the questions. I thought it was really great. Uh, we do have a couple minutes, so if uh, anyone else in the audience has a question for any of these fine young men, um, speak now. All right, well, you guys were thorough. I thought that was excellent. Oh, wait, we have a question. Yes. Um, well, my, uh, in, when interviewing my machine shop manager, this is actually one of the big areas that he um, was concerned with the most. Um, he says, I can train him to, to be a machinist, and I can train him to do other uh, work skills, but I can't train him to show up on time, and I can't train him to have a good attitude. And um, so that was kind of one of his frustrations, is that um, the soft skills are, are lacking. Yeah, with, with us, you know, we're very realistic with expectations beforehand, letting people know what kind of environment they're coming into and what they can expect if they're not meeting their expectations. Um, you know, we let them know, hey, if you're not pulling your weight, if you're not coming up, showing up on time, your team members are going to be coming at you and letting you know. Uh, and, and so some people are okay with that and others aren't. So some of it is, you know, being very clear up, very upfront, helping them understand what kind of environment it is, what the expectations are, what would they be coming into. Um, some people self-select out of that uh, because they know it's just 
you know, I I'm, would prefer to work on, uh, by myself, not on such a strong team. And then as part of our interview process, we do have multiple steps in it, and we have them come back a couple times, um, and they are subjected through panel interviews um, that are including the, the people that are going to be on their team. Um, so we get input from a number of different people that have interviewed them and worked with them and, and you know, looking at, without getting too much in the details, but looking at, okay, here are the things we're looking for as, as an employee um, and how do they match up with that. Um, of course, then there's background screening and all that that also catches some things that maybe we missed. Um, so in the end, I think it's a pretty thorough process, and you have to be. You know, if you're looking for cultural fit, then you really got to find out how someone's personality is going to fit with that. Anything to add, Roger? I'm um, actually just pretty similar to Ben's situation. I just think that's a big key is the team or panel interviews. Almost always before you get hired, you get interviewed by your future teammates, and they're going to be able to ask the questions that sometimes maybe a boss won't ask and sometimes also get more frank answers sometimes than the manager or supervisor will get. And that's always been a big key to our success as well. Not to say we haven't had mistakes here and there, but sometimes you don't know about the not showing up on time till the first day when they don't show up on time. So <laughs> that happens sometimes. And, and I might just add that, uh, you know, the governor mentioned uh, pursuing work-ready communities. Uh, and embedded in that notion is a, a, a device called the National Career Readiness <laughs> Certificate which does have and will have a soft skills component added to that, which I think um, will be a very valuable tool for regional employers. We, as an organization, we help support about 3,000 national skills readiness certificates over the last two years in the region. And this uh, NCRC Plus, which includes this, the soft skill component, will be new and uh, as part of the region's strategic workforce plan, we have committed to try and become a work-ready community. So that will mean that we're gonna roll that out in partnership with the colleges, WorkSource Oregon and others. And so hopefully we can engage with some employers and help them understand the value of looking at that as a tool uh, on the front end. Do you know when? Because it's not offered now, right? Pardon me? is not offered in Oregon now. Uh, it will probably be sometime after the first of the year. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. I'm whoa. Uh, Jim Schlocker, Superintendent Gresham Bartle School District. Uh, on behalf of not only the Gresham Bartle School District, but the Reynolds School District and the Centennial, all present here, and Director Carol Egan of Center for Advanced Learning, Toyo Tonzo has been a partner with us that we are actually one of the best kept secrets in East County in terms of having high school students prepare for industry in the workforce and would invite also the other companies and others in this room to partner with us. We have the ACE Academy as well, which is a partnership with districts. So our K-12 schools in East County are all in. Uh, and so I really want to encourage folks to, to learn more about how they can be involved and thank those who are involved with us in, as we get our education kits ready for the workforce. So thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, in keeping with the philosophy, I, we've done a lot of work in East County about buy local. And when we look at uh, buy local, we have to also think about buying your local labor force. And one of the statistics that I look at regularly indicates that about 68% of the people who live in Gresham work outside of Gresham. And about 45% of the jobs in Gresham are held by people who live outside of Gresham. What can we do as businesses to ensure that we're buying local labor force more than we're exporting? <clears throat> okay. Um, <laughs> That's above my pay. <laughs> He's know, a training guy. Really, when it comes down to it, when, as a business, and when we have a need, we're going to try to fill it with the best possible person for that need. Um, and, and so the only thing I can answer to that is if you want more people in Gresham having the Gresham jobs, then they need to be, the workers in Gresham need to be stronger than the, the workers elsewhere. Um, but that, that is a philosophical thing because what's, you know, someone lives in Gresham but has a job in, in Fairview. In, you know, what's, uh, I don't know if there's anything wrong with that. But yeah, like I mentioned, we do have a couple people coming all the way up from Albany 
Um, some of our highly skilled maintenance um, individuals are coming from that. I mean, that's a, you know, that's quite a, a drive, a commute to be making every day. Um, but they're better than anything we could have gotten around here. So, I mean, it just comes down to making the, the best decision for, for the business. All right, well, thanks very much. everyone, the panel and um, Andrew and everyone for being here. I feel like today has been a great success and um, it's um, to the credit of many. Um, we had a committee that helped put this presentation together. We did a lot of brainstorming. I call it our brain trust. That's what we use it as to have a flow for the day and to have relevant content for everyone here. Um, I was thinking about a couple of things. You know, we talked about the industrial land and the push for that and why that's so important is industrial land typically is for traded sector jobs as we talked about. And for one traded sector job, there are typically 2.5 support jobs that come with it through vendors that support those companies. So if you think about the multiple effect of that, that's very important. The other thing that was on my mind is about the local stakeholders. Well, guys, that's us. We are the local stakeholders in the room. We are the ones who can make an impact. And that's part of what today is about, is all of us thinking about what is our piece in this? Is it a, the, working on the alignment between government, uh, industry, and academics? What is it? Think about what your role is and how you can impact that. And so with that today, I will leave you with that. And thank you very much for coming. And please, please, please fill out your evaluation form. Um, this helps us to shape our program. We would like your candid feedback. Um, I didn't put um, anything on here about the time of day or the length, but please feel free to share all your comments because this will help us to continue to grow our strong programming and to be successful as a chamber and an organization. So thank you so much for being here.